Fear, paranoia, and chaos. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures and follow me along as we go through this, please. One second, brethren. All right. Please follow me along in the scriptures. Turn with me in the scriptures to James chapter 1. I'm going to read two verses to start. I'll actually, uh, verses 5 on to verse 8. In James chapter 1. Follow me along. If any of you lack wisdom, and wisdom is equated with the fear of the Lord, okay? Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Unstable. One of the things that was said of Reuben, that he was unstable as water. Water can be made to go violent with wind. Tossed. And foam out shame and stuff like that. And see, when dealing with devils and or devil possession or devil oppression with people, you will see this. You will see bouts of fear, paranoia, and chaos, and violence, and anger, and all kinds of things. Why? Because they are unstable. Because devils are whispering into their ears. And then devils flock around to them. Cheering them on. All the while caring nothing for them. But remember, the enemy of your enemy is your friend, right? Hmm. You know, there is something to, um, you know, for example, haunted houses. Those, you know, I've met these Christians who say, oh, well, we don't believe in ghosts. It's like, but okay, you believe in the Holy Ghost? We're like, yeah. Okay, so you don't believe in ghosts like ghosts can haunt a house. You know, when you, wherever you live, like your closet, certain things get moved to one side. You hear voices, certain bumps in the night, things move. That's a reality, brethren. There is such a thing as a haunted house. Devil spirits can move and poltergeist activity and stuff like that. That is real. Okay? That is real. That stuff kind of happens. I mean, that stuff happens. Okay? That really does. And when you have things like that, it is at the name of Jesus, every knee shall, shall bow. Uh, every knee shall bend, every knee shall bow. Excuse me. <laughs> But yeah, when you're dealing with devils and devil oppressed and devil possessed people, they're like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro. And suddenly the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Turn to 1 Samuel. Come on. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to look at a prime example of this. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to be looking a little bit at Saul. Now, while we're looking at Saul, we have to remember some things. This is under the dispensation of the law. Okay? The Holy Ghost was not a permanent resident in anybody. Okay, he could come and go, come and go, come and go. Eternal security, that seal, that circumcision made without hands was not in this dispensation. Okay? There was no eternal security here. Okay? 
So we have to remember that under the law, it was faith and works. You had to offer animal sacrifices. And the faith that you had was faith in what God will do. Whereas today we have faith on what God has done. We have faith on him personally because God is the one who saved us by grace through faith. Okay, So we have to remember, study to shoe thyself approved unto God, that you be a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, So, thinking dispensationally, but remembering this also for our instruction in righteousness. We're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 16, reading one verse here. Okay? Reading one verse. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14. About King Saul, who feared men, who blamed other people for his own actions. The old man, the Adamic nature, as it is called, was rife and prevalent within Saul. When Samuel, uh, when Samuel came to him, it's like, what's the bleeding of these things that I hear in my ears? And Saul's like, it's the people. Yeah, okay, yeah, I messed up. But it was the people, see. And because Saul was unstable, tossed to and fro, by winds, because he feared man. 1 Samuel 16, verse 14, one verse to start. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. An evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. The Lord allowed gave permission for an evil spirit to come upon Saul. And what did this evil spirit do unto Saul? Samuel, 1 Samuel 18, verses 5 on to verse 12. First Samuel 18, verses 5 on to verse 12. In the contrast, is David, the Lord's anointed. Saul was the Lord's anointed, but um, Saul messed up. And as we just saw, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and the Lord gave him an evil spirit to trouble him, meaning that he allowed the evil spirit to come onto Saul. And David was a man who sought, who was after God's own heart. And David went out with her, so, uh, verses 5 on to verse 12. Please follow me along. No one else is going to tell you this. They're just going to cheer you on. One might, but very few people are going to share this with you. And you leave me no choice. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of all Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another, and they, and as they played, and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Look at Saul's reaction. Remember, there was an evil spirit from the Lord that troubled him. Fear. And Saul was very wroth, chaos, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but ten thousands. 
And what can he have more but the kingdom? Paranoia? Yeah, I know paranoia is not in the scriptures. I know. Fear is. And Saul eyed David from that day forward. Kept his eye on him. Why? Because Saul was a little paranoid. Had a lot of fear. And rightfully so. Verse 10 on to verse 12 now. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul. And he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand, as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. David was just playing beautiful music, probably a hymn as far as we know. He was the sweet psalmist of Israel. But see, this evil spirit came upon Saul and he prophesied. Prophesying there, I, I liken onto the prophesying that you see today through the charismatics. Blah, 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 blah. As far as we know, it wasn't the spirit of the Lord that was upon him, but it was an evil spirit upon Saul, wasn't it? And that evil spirit made him to prophesy, speak, all kinds of rambling, blah, 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 blah things, didn't he? And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. David was doing nothing but trying to help him with good music. And what did Saul do? And Saul cast a javelin, for he said, I will smite David, even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Hmm. And that's something. Now look at verses 28 and on to verse 29 in Samuel 18, 1 Samuel 18. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Why? Saul, because of that evil spirit, because he had displeased the Lord. He was filled with fear, paranoia, chaos. First Samuel 19, verses 8 on to verse 10. Now check this out. This is very interesting. Brethren, pay attention. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines. There's war going on. There are spiritual, there is a spiritual war going on. There is a battle. And those of us of the Church of the Living God, whatever capacity you are in, going out, doing our part of the battle as the, our Lord guides us. Preaching, laying out tracts, witnessing to people, talking to people, helping people, whatever it is. Whatever capacity you are in, we're out there doing the battle. We're fighting this as led by the Lord, okay? And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a the great slaughter, and they fled from him, okay? David was doing right. He was out there doing battle. Verse 9, and the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. And David played with his hand again. This is twice after Saul with this evil spirit, boom, threw a javelin at him. And yet David is there yet again, trying to pacify, to comfortably playing with the, the harp, okay? And Saul sought to smite David, even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. David was doing absolutely nothing 
to Saul. And yet Saul, because of that evil spirit, filled with fear, paranoia, chaos. Because of this, because of that evil spirit, you could say quite easily that Saul's life henceforth was quite chaotic. Hence, what happens when evil spirits are involved. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 25 on to verse 33. Now this is when um, Jonathan and David made a, made a plan, a pact. It's like Jonathan said, I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to talk to him and see that, you know, that there ain't nothing wrong. You know, because Jonathan's like, hey, he, 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 my, okay, my, my father, he's got some problems, yeah, but he, he, doesn't, he doesn't have a vendetta against you. So I'm going to go try him. Check it out. Okay, that's the backstory of 1 Samuel chapter 20. We pick up at verse, uh, let's read verse 24 on to verse 33, okay? Or verse 34, excuse me. Yeah, verses 24 on to verse 34 in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, okay? So David hid himself in the field. And when the new moon was com come, the king sat him down to eat meat. And the king sat upon his seat, as at other times, even upon a seat by the wall, and Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side. And David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spake not anything that day. For he thought, something had befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan his son, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet, neither yesterday nor today? And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, Let me go, I pray thee, for our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother he hath commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and, set, and see my brethren. Therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord, David isn't uh, involved with the king's table. <laughs> I'm saying, hey, I'm sorry there, buddy boy. Keep smiling, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> now check this out. Saul's reaction. Everybody's out to get him. See, Saul had a, what is known as a guilty conscience and thinks, you know, everybody's whispering about him. The whole world is get, out to get him. Why? Because he had an evil spirit given unto him by the Lord. In other words, the Lord's like, okay, I'm out of here. Here's an evil spirit for you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tempt him. Go ahead. Make him fear. Fill him with paranoia. Make his life chaotic. Everybody's out to get me. Oh, oh no. Called the guilty conscience. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, Thou son of the, of the perverse, rebellious woman. Say this to his son. What did Jonathan do to invoke this? Nothing. Do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion? And unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lieth upon the ground, liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. Hmm. See, in Saul's fear, paranoia, and chaos, he made one thing his full, his sole focus. Not the fact that he was wrong with the Lord. No. He turned that onto David. And David became his everything. He was obsessed 
Hence, that's what these devils do. They get obsessed with people. Look at the people who attack Brian Denlinger. I rest my case. Okay? They're obsessed. They can't get to God. So they go after the messenger. And Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? But see, Saul, in his fear, paranoia, and chaos, was coming up with all kinds of things in his mind. Why? Because evil, the evil spirit was whispering, He's doing this to you. Look, they're, they're all whispering about you. Oh, everybody's out to get you. It's a conspiracy. And look what, Saul, uh, look what Saul did unto his own son. And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him. His own son, Jonathan, who merely has, what did David do? And Saul, in his fear, paranoia, and chaos, whew, threw a uh, javelin at his own son. And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat no meat the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. You can definitely say that Saul had a lot of issues. And see, because of that evil spirit, there's no peace. There's no peace. And look at how Saul behaved here. He behaved as an enemy of the Lord, going to slay his own son. So he took upon him that what the, those who are against our Lord does. First Samuel chapter 22. <laughs> my friend in Canada, my actual one who we can't talk to each other. Hope you're happy now. First Samuel chapter 22, verses 7 on to verse 10. Now, David got away from Saul, okay? He, he ran away. And then he went and um, he went to the priests and whatnot. And Doeg the Enamite was there and saw him, okay? So David went and hid out with the priest for a moment. And the sword of Goliath was there. And he told the priest, it's like, I, I had to go in haste because the king's business required it. And I didn't bring my weapons or anything. You got anything here? And the priest was like, oh, yeah, we got the shoe bread. Uh, if you guys, if your men have kept themselves from women. And, oh, we got the sword of uh, Goliath. And David's like, come on, give it to me. I need it. Okay. But there was a guy there called Doeg the Edomite. The enemy of your enemy is your friend, huh? Hmm. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 7 on to verse 10. Uh, let's read verses 6 on to verse 10. When Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men that were with him, now Saul abode in Gebeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand. There's, <laughs> there's that thing again. And all his servants were standing about him. Then Saul, then Saul said unto his servants that stood about him, Hear now, ye Benjamites, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards and make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds? That all of you have conspired against me. And there is none that sheweth me 
that my son hath made a league with the son of Jesse, and there is none of you that is sorry for me, or sheweth unto me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this, as at this day. And we know for certain David did none, nothing of the sort. See, this came upon Saul because of that evil spirit that filled his brain with fear, paranoia, and chaos. And nobody will have mercy upon me. Feigning himself, making himself to look. Even though he was truly afflicted, Saul was truly affl afflicted, he was using that to gain sympathy in order that he could attack his enemy. Beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. Okay. Verse 9. Then answered Doeg the Edomite, Edom, Esau, the brother of Jacob, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him victuals, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then if we were to continue reading, Saul goes to the priests of the Lord. And these priests just, you know, David said, hey, I gotta go. They were innocent. The priests were innocent, as was David. But what did Saul do? In his fear, paranoia, and chaos, and because of what Doeg the Edomite, with his big mouth, killed the priests of the Lord. Doeg, it's, Doeg the Edomite was the one who did it. The enemy of your enemy is your friend? Okay. <laughs> okay. Samuel chapter 23, verses 19 on to verse 24 now. Sam, 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 19 on to verse 24. Then came up the Ziphites to Saul and Gabeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the wood in the hill of Hakaliah, which is on the south of Jeshmon? So where David was hiding, causing no stirs or anything like that, the people amongst whom he was turned on him and turned him in over onto Saul. Okay? And look at this. Verse 20, Now therefore, O king, come down according to all thy desire, all the desire of thy soul to come down. And on our part, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. Be careful of the company you keep. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm here to tell you, brethren. <laughs> be careful of the company you keep. Like I said, to this day, there are truly only seven people that I truly trust. And unfortunately now, there might be only six or maybe even five. Careful. Be careful of that company you keep. And Saul said, and look at Saul. Blessed be ye of the Lord, for ye had compassion on me. They were turning over a righteous man to be murdered by a man who was filled with an evil spirit, filled with fear, paranoia, and chaos. Go, I pray you, prepare yet, and know and see his place where he, his haunt is. Spy on him, give, him, give me information. This is what Jesuits do. This is what infiltrators do to get information. And who hath seen him there? For it has told me that he deal with, dealeth very subtlety. 
See therefore and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself. And come ye again to me with that with the certainty, and I will go with you. And it shall come to pass, if he be in the land, that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshmon. So David got out of there. But see, the company that saw that David kept, that he was in, they turned on him and wanted to turn him over to King Saul so he can get killed. King Saul had an evil spirit filled with fear, paranoia, and chaos. Then spies went in to get information to relay back to him. This is the framework of what Jesuit coadjutors, infiltrators do. <laughs> the shoe fits, huh? <laughs> Go to Proverbs. Go to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 12, verses 15, unto the close of the chapter. Proverbs 12, verses 15 on to the close of the chapter. Proverbs 12, verses 15 on to the close of the chapter, okay? The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. A fool's wrath is presently known... What does the scripture say a fool is? But a prudent man covereth shame, and prudence is linked unto the fear of the Lord, which is wisdom. He that speaketh truth sheweth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. The tongue of the wise, wise, being uh, having wisdom, the fear of the Lord. There is that that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. Today is the 30th proverb. Today is 30th. Their jaw teeth are knives. The lip of truth shall be established forever. But a lying tongue is but for a moment. A lying tongue is but for a moment. You know, like being unstable as water. It's there in its chaotic majesty. And then it goes flat. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. But to the counselors of peace is joy. There shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. Lying lips are, are, are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduceth them. Encircling you like vultures around a dead carcass. 
The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. And of course, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 2 on to verse 3. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. For a dream cometh through the multitude of busyness, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verses 11 on to verse 14. <laughs> Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. And a babbler is no better. The words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness. A fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be, and what shall be and what shall be after him? Who can tell him? Who can tell him anything? Go now to Luke. Remember, this is for instruction in righteousness. Okay? Go to Luke chapter 4. No, we're not going to go through, uh, to what you might be immediately thinking, uh, be thinking of. But isn't it a... Excuse me, interesting coincidence that it is in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 31 on to verse 36. Luke chapter 4. Uh, let's see. No, excuse me, verses 33 on to verse 36 in uh, Luke chapter 4. Beg your pardon. Verses 33 on to verse 36. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a, spirit, had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone! What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? This is an unclean devil who's saying this, okay? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the mist, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits. And they come out. An unclean spirit. What have we to do with thee? <laughs> thou Jesus of Nazareth. Art thou come to destroy us? Hmm? A little paranoia? A little fear? A little chaos? Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Now... It's important when you're reading on this, especially, you take in the context, okay? We're going to read verses 43 on to verse 45 here in Matthew chapter 12, okay? But, I actually, let's read verses 34 on to verse 45. Let's get, let's get some of the context here, okay? Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 on to verse 45, okay? Hmm. 
Verses 33 and verses uh, 34 actually says, Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart that mouth spiketh. You disgusting devil. Lying to him. <laughs> I've never hated you. I've just ridiculed you. And then you say you love him in the Lord. You disgusting filth. Your filth. And you're believing these people. You ought to know better. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Different dispensational thing. This is for instruction in righteousness, okay? Let's continue. Then certain of the scribes and the, of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. See, he's talking about, before we read verses 43 on to verse 45, the context is he's addressing those who are religious on the outside, but they are not truly a new creature. Okay? He's addressing those who speak fair words, but in reality... They can't speak truth, which are good words. Talking about people who can clean up something just for a little while. But then again, like we saw in San, uh, King Saul, then that evil spirit comes, fills him with fear, paranoia, and chaos. Verse 33 on to verse 45. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, okay, the unclean spirit goes out, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. So the spirit is returning to where he came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished, cleaned up. But see, not long lasting. We have to remember, too, the dispensational difference here and the context of that. But like I said, this is for our instruction in righteousness. Let's continue. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other, seven other spirits more wicked than himself. You know, the vultures surrounding the carcass. Okay? And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Look at that verse. Don't look at me. Look at that verse. Look at that verse. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. The vultures surrounding, egging people on. And they enter in and dwell there. Because remember, the enemy of your enemy is your friend, right? Okay? And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Huh. 
Wake up. Wake up. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. And about these vultures. About these vultures. Jude chapter 12. Uh, Jude, chap Jude doesn't have chapters. Beg your pardon. Jude 12 on to verse 19. These people who just love you all of a sudden. Where were they? Especially two of them. <laughs> These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh, seventh from Adam, prophesied of these in the book of Enoch. <clears throat> you weren't expecting that, were you? And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying... Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So God's judgment on the lost could be to convince them of their ungodly deeds and their ungodly speeches. Wow, imagine that. The exception to that is when someone has chosen to serve the Vatican, Satan, the devil. Okay, that is the difference. When you have someone who has made the choice in their mind and in their heart to serve the devil... Okay, go ahead, live it up. You're a tough guy, okay? Go ahead. But for the lost, when you ask your righteous judgment, that it may, God's judgment may convince them and cut them, you know, prick their heart, that kind of thing. Asking God's judgment upon the wicked is not always a death sentence. Who knows through that judgment, that person might have their eyes opened and come to repentance. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. The vultures, the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Oh, oh. Oh, these be they who separate themselves, sensual, led by their senses, having not the spirit. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 on to verse 29. Pick your pardon. 
when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And whithersoever he taketh him, he teareth him. And he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples, that they should cast him out, and they could not. He, answer, he answereth him, and saith, O oh, faithless generation, how, shall, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. So, going on to Jesus. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. So this oppression from the spirit, this possession of the spirit, has been there for a long time. Maybe goes out for a while, comes back to a nice clean place, but then bringeth seven more uh, more wicked spirits than himself, and they make their abode in there. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Remember, you have to, this is before the death, burial, and resurrection, speaking unto Jews, okay? You know, they had to believe on their king, who was right there, okay? And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came rushing together, running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter it no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, and so much that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind cometh, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. It was a while. where one did very well. But then this one who was doing very well, under great affliction, doing wonderful work for the Lord, let more than one person aware of circumstances while doing this work for the Lord. He went publicly with that was a brave move. And then the friends that are circling like vultures do to a carcass, they jumped on it. They gang-raped it. And after the fact, it was like, wow, Things were, things were, certain things were happening while doing these good works for the Lord. Um, forgive me. Please forgive me. Because when information was known, yes, I should have spoke up. I was wrong. And until certain uh, things came to light, everything seemed like it was doing well.
But the Lord took the charge there and did what was right. And while I still, until recent events, still had hope. There is still hope. Because when one is still alive and drawing breath, you ain't dead, you have chance, you have a chance. There is hope for today. But, um, yeah, I, uh, I should have said something when certain information came out to light. All the while when you were doing certain things for the Lord. It was, you did these things and then you came out with this information. And that is the truth and you know it. At that moment... I should have stepped up and been like, hey. But you're right, I didn't. And for my part, I do certainly take responsibility. And please forgive me. My only hope is that what is clouding and surrounding through prayer and fasting, gets cast out. Because an, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And as past has shown, like the wave of the sea. This should have been said a long time ago, yes. And for that, I... I repent. But those who are circling you now will never tell you anything like this. Because the enemy of their enemy is their friend. Please be careful. Please be careful. And don't forget to lock your door at night. Thank you, brethren. And I will see you in the next video.